Hello and welcome to another episode of the Carpe Historian podcast. I am your host, Carter, uh, and today I'm talking about a topic that is very near and dear to my heart as of late, as I have put a lot of effort into writing a research paper for one of my classes about it. And that, as you may have guessed by the picture, is the B-29 and the bombing of Japan. And I hope in the next, hopefully it rounds to be about a half hour, to talk just about the B-29, about Curtis LeMay, and about strategic bombing in World War II. And I know that that's a big topic that many books have been written about that are hundreds of pages long. I'm just trying to do a bit of a brief overview here, just get some of the big points, uh, what we can learn about it, uh, why people did what they did, and uh, how they did it. So, the idea of strategic bombing because uh, we'll, st we'll start there, right? You kind of got to cover everything leading up to this moment because the B-29 is a... The, the, the events that led up to the B-29 are really why... It, you can't talk about it without having discussed prior events because the B-29 is the culmination of 30 years of United States uh, strategic policy regarding aerial warfare and doctrine and all that. Uh, and it is the culmination of uh, what came to be known as strategic bombing, which is, a co which is a term coined, at least in the United States, by a man named Billy Mitchell. Now, Billy Mitchell was a member of the U.S. Army Air Corps in the 1910s and 20s. And I think even into the 30s, though I don't think it was he was in the Air Corps for much longer in the 30s. He was one of the Air or the what would become the Air Force's main strategic thinkers during this period. Now, when I, when I say that, that isn't to say that he was one of the top brass. He was innovative. And he came up with a whole bunch of new ideas, but the ideas that he came up with really made a lot of people angry. They, they really did. Uh, specifically, the people in the Navy and in the Army who were not part of the Air Corps. They really did not like what Mitchell had to say. Because Mitchell proposed a whole bunch of ideas that fundamentally would... that that fundamentally reject the role that the army and the navy had played up until that point. And they're all to do with the applications of air power. Uh, the first one, one of his, the, the, the thing that pissed off the navy, is he said that airplanes could sink battleships with bombs and torpedoes. Now the navy, up until this point, the whole idea of every navy on earth had been if you build a big boat and it's bigger than the enemy's boats, you will win. And up, up until recently, it's been, you know, more armor, more guns, bigger guns, right? Like the whole dreadnought idea, battleships. The Navy loved their battleships. And Billy Mitchell walked up to them and said with a straight face, I will sink your battleship with one of my planes. And so the Navy was understandably a bit angry and concerned when he said this, because, of course, in the post-World War I United States, the military budget was getting cut left and right, and so the Navy really wanted their slice of the government pie here, and they couldn't have a guy like Billy Mitchell going around taking, t uh, taking their money away from them. Like, if the president said, I'm going to take this money from the Navy, or, you know, just take this money. It doesn't even have to be from the Navy, but it would eventually be coming from the Navy's pockets. I'm going to take this money, and instead of putting it with the Navy, I'm going to put it in the growing Air Corps, because this guy says that he can do better stuff than the Navy can with it. The Navy does not like that at all. and so the, But the Navy is confident, and so they propose a little game for Mitchell to play. After World War I, the Allied powers had inherited the German high seas fleet with all their battleships and stuff, and they had split many of the ships between them to conduct research and that kind of thing, see how the German 
German ships worked and maybe build new designs for warships based off of things that they learned from the Germans. And uh, the Navy had one of these German battleships. I, I forget what the name of it was. And they told Billy Mitchell, hey, we're going to put this, we're going to park this battleship out in the middle of the Chesapeake Bay, and you can come in with your bomber and drop your bomb on it, and if it sinks, you know, <laughs> congratulations, you can sink a battleship. But we don't think you're going to do that. So th that, that, they were counting on that. They were hoping that it would be a miserable failure for Billy Mitchell. Uh, so the day comes, they park, I think the Germans, German ship's name was the Deutschland, though I'm not sure. Uh, they park the ship out in the middle of the Chesapeake Bay. Billy Mitchell comes with his bomber, flies over the ship, drops like a, I think it was a 2,000 pound bomb, and BAM! There's a big explosion. Mushroom cloud starts coming over the ship. Navy guys all of a sudden start getting paler in the face as they see the battleship turn over and sink. Billy Mitchell had just sunk a battleship for the first time in history using an airplane. Now, you may think, okay, well, this is pretty cool, but, like, you know, the battleship was standing there, just kind of parked out in the middle of the Chesapeake Bay, not really doing anything. Nobody's shooting at the plane. You know, it's just got a perfect bomb run. The weather was fine, right? So the conditions were optimal. Like, of course you're going to hit a battleship with a bomb. But the Navy was still very scared about the possibility of losing taxpayer dollars and ordered a massive cover-up. Though, of course, the people who saw it, you can't just silence them because most of them were not part of the military. See, so they're not subject to the code of military justice. So the Navy can't silence them. And one of these guys was a Japanese person. Uh, and I believe his name was Isoroku Yamamoto. Now, Yamamoto, as we'll learn later, would be a uh, very important figure for air power in World War II. Um, I'm not sure if it was Yamamoto. I, I think it was Yamamoto, but I could be wrong. Um, and so after this demonstration, the Navy says, all right, we're going to try this one more time. What well, we're going to, or actually, this is a number of years later. Billy Mitchell has already kind of faded into obscurity because the Navy court-martialed him because they ordered him to shut up about it, about the whole uh, doctrines and sinking the battleship thing. They ordered him to shut up. And Mitchell just said, nope, I'm going to keep going. And he'd leak documents to the press. He'd write articles using classified information. <laughs> classified information, the classified information being that the ship was sunk, right? You know, and, and so he, even though he was right, he was breaking the uniform code of military justice. And so I, I would argue rightfully was court-martialed. Although, it's sad that they made him shut up about it in the first place. Like, it was unjust that they made him shut up about it. Um, especially since he was vindicated. And during his court-martial, uh, guys like Hap Arnold, uh, Douglas MacArthur was one of the judges, Hap Arnold was one of his witnesses. Uh, so guys that became very famous later on in World War II, I think George Marshall was there, if I'm not wrong. Uh, and so, Billy Mitchell... Even though he was in the middle of his court-martial, he just uses that podium in the courtroom as a venue to spread his ideas. He would bring his book that he had written about the applications of air power into the courtroom and just start reading excerpts from it, even though the judges would tell him to shut up and sit down, right? <laughs> he went absolutely bonkers on these guys. And one of the predictions he made during that court trial, uh, or the court-martial, whatever you want to call it, he predicted that the Japanese would declare war on the United States and bomb the United States fleet at Pearl Harbor on some, fine, on some quote, fine Sunday morning. Now, if you're familiar with America's involvement in World War II, you'll know that December 7th, 1941, the day Japan bombed Pearl Harbor and sunk, I think, three or four of the Navy's prized battleships, was a Sunday, a very bright Partly cloudy Sunday, a very fine Sunday morning. Um, so it proved very prophetic for uh, United States history later on. Unfortunately, at the cost of about fifteen hundred sailors. Uh, but, but so that's that's Mitchell, right? The Navy in the nineteen thirties is starting to get a little bit more confident again. Their confidence boost after that initial setback of, oh shoot, the 
airplanes are actually able to sink the stationary German battleship. That We'll see if we can prove it wrong, you know, like if we can actually move, right, and start moving around on the open ocean. Well, you know, surely they won't be able to hit us because they're inaccurate with their bombs. Right? You could, you wouldn't be able to hit a moving battleship if it's ducking and weaving, changing speeds. It's going to be insanely difficult to line up that shot. Well, in the 1930s, the Navy decides to have another go. And a guy named Curtis LeMay, along with uh, a whole bunch of other soon-to-be very famous uh, Air Force notables, uh, they set off in their B-17s in a test to try and sink with dummy bombs, like, basically the equi- the bomb equivalent of a water balloon. It's a, just a water-filled bomb. It can still hurt you if, you la- if it lands on you, but the idea is that the Navy guys are going to be below decks so that it won't hurt any of them. Um, the, uh, the, they set out in their newly made B-17 bombers. I think this was the mid-1930s, because the B-17 came out in 35, I think. That was the first prototype. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. And so the Navy, the the idea of the whole exercise was the Navy would give the Army Air Force, or n- the Army Air Corps, who soon become the Army Air Forces in 1941, I think, uh, they would give the Army Air Corps a approximate location of where the battleship was. They'd have to fly out from California over the Pacific Ocean, about 100, 150 miles off the coast, and fly to that area, and that was where the battleship was supposed to be. Moving around, maneuvering, ducking and weaving, dodging, you know, trying to do all the their darndest to make the bomb hits, not hits, but misses. And so the navigator of, the main navigator of the mission, Curtis LeMay, uh, he, the planes, he navigates them out to the spot where the Navy radioed that they would be, and the, pla- and the ship's not there. I think it was the USS Texas? I'm not sure. Uh, it might have been the Utah. Or maybe I'm just completely wrong, and it's none of those two. Anyway, so they go to the spot. The ships aren't there. What do they do? Well, basically, they're just kind of flying around looking for the ships. They head in a general direction, which they think the ship might have gone. And uh, about 30 seconds before LeMay is about to tell the guy, all right, I think we should turn around because we're going to run out of fuel, they spot the battleship. It turns out that the Navy had given them the wrong coordinates. They were one degree off. Like, uh, one... Uh, like, one degree off on the map. And that meant that they were about 25 miles away from where the ship was supposed to be. Now, the Navy will always tell you, and here, let me take a sip of my water, that this was an honest mistake by the guy on the ship, saying, oh yeah, we're at this location when they were actually at this location. But to me, considering their track record with the Air Corps, I think it's more likely than not that this was on purpose to try and throw them off, just as a kind of an extra safety, right? You know, like, oh, well, if they couldn't even find us, <laughs> right? Then, of course, they're not going to be able to kill battleships with their bombs, right? Um, so, the LeMay and his B-17... Uh, I shouldn't say LeMay. He was just the navigator. But the B-17s fly over drop their bombs, and score, I think, two direct hits on the ship, which counts as a win for the Air Corps. And so they get back hollering and whooping back to their, you know, crews and everybody back at the base saying, we got them, we got them. And the Navy once again orders a massive cover-up, except this time Billy Mitchell isn't there, and so he's not there to start spewing out and leaking information. So it does work that time. Uh, Come... Uh, 1941, you know, not much has really changed. The Air Corps is still extremely small, except for when in mid-1941, uh, President Roosevelt, in response to events in Europe that uh, shall not go, uh, shall not be named, he orders the all, all the departments of the armed services to submit plans for the defense of America. And uh, the Air Force, or the Air Corps, were Actually, at this point, I believe it's named the Arm- the United States Army Air Forces. So it's still part of the Army, but it's almost the Air Force. It has Air Force in the name, with an S attached to it. Uh, the Air Force, I'm just going to call it that from now on, because that's practically what it is. Uh, the Air Force submits AWPD-1, Air War Plans 1, or Airport- 
Air War Plans Division 1. Their report on what they would need to fight a war in, quote, the defense of the homeland, even though everybody really knows it's going to happen in Europe or in the Pacific. It's not just going to be a defensive war. So, and the message is pretty simple. They need bombers and fighters, but mostly bombers, because the idea is what is another one of Mitchell's, that by bombing the enemy's industry and infrastructure, you can eliminate their ability to wage war without even having bombed their troops. Because if the troops are fighting on the front line, their gun breaks. Oh shoot, I need a new gun. They ask the people in the back lines, the logistics expert, experts, you know, hey, can I have a new gun? The guy there says, uh, well, actually, that we haven't been getting a number, we haven't been getting many of our guns recently. I, I don't know what's happened. Then they, you know, send a guy back to towards the factory to see what the heck's going on. And they notice that one of the bridges is blown out by bombs. Oh, well, that, that's that's a problem. We, we can't get the guns over the bridge. So, you know, he takes a boat across the river, heads back into the town, and sees that the factory is just a pile of rubble. Oh, well, that that's your problem, isn't it? We, we don't have guns because we can't make any more guns because somebody just destroyed the factory. Well, that would be the planes for you. That's the idea of strategic bombing, is eliminating the enemy's ability to wage a war by just knocking out their equipment and their ability to move troops, right? So, the Army Air Forces wants to use bombers for that purpose, to bomb factories, bomb infrastructure, bomb oil refineries. You know, if, you, if you're if you using tanks but don't have any fuel, they're really just sitting, like, stationary artillery. Uh, the Germans actually, for want of fuel, and also because these tanks were pretty obsolete, on the Atlantic Wall would... Uh, take German would take their tanks, just take the turret off and put it on top of a bunker to act as an artillery piece. True story. Um, and so the president gets this report. He doesn't really know much better, so he just says, All right. The guys in the Navy give him a really funny look, an annoyed look, too. Uh, and some people in the Army as well. And then, uh, then Pearl Harbor happens. Now, the Air Force before AWPD-1 numbered maybe 5,000 planes. With AWPD-1, President Roosevelt had authorized the construction of about 20,000 more planes, so quadrupling the size of the Air Force. Then Pearl Harbor happened, and Roosevelt wanted uh, 40,000 planes in one year. So, all of a sudden, the, the Army Air Forces has gone from 5,000 planes of what is one of the smallest air forces in the world, even though that the United States was the first country to enter powered flight with the Wright brothers. Many of the people in the original Air Force, including Hap Arnold, who was the head of the Air Force at this time, uh, were trained to fly by Wilbur and Orville Wright themselves. Uh, they, it, it has just exploded in size due to the nature of, you know, the the conflict which the United States was then in. Uh, in World War II, I'm just going to talk about the bombing here because there's a whole bunch of uh, really cool stuff having to do with Hoyt Vandenberg and the 9th Air Force, which was the tactical air force. I, I should talk about that at some other date, but right now I'm just focusing on strategic bombing for our purposes. The strategic bombing campaign, you can kind of split it both chronologically and uh, doctrinally into two distinct parts. One is the European theater, one is the Pacific theater. Not in the same way that you can for the regular military actions, like, you know, because it's physically happening in the Pacific, but there's two different strategies. In Europe, we employed, we employed uh, tar individual, in individual target bombing. I I'm It's late at night, I'm sorry. Uh... I can't pronounce words late at night. So, the idea in Europe was that bombers would use their bomb sites and visually bomb a specific factory, bridge, etc. Right? So, you go in and you take a really long, painstaking time under flak fire, you know, knocking your plane around, aiming at a target, you drop your bombs, and they fall, and just, bwammo, the factory's gone, right? 
And this worked for the most part in Europe. Uh, it worked really well. Uh, the German war economy was crippled by American and British bombing. So much so that... Well, okay, so when I say crippled, we destroyed some of the factories. We destroyed a lot of the factories. But the factories we didn't destroy, we didn't have to destroy. Because what the Germans realized was that it was suicide to keep their facilities in these open factories out in the middle of these cities that can be bombed. So the, it, German production took a huge hit when the German uh, minister of production, Albert Speer, ordered all of the materials of making weapons to be moved into discrete locations up in the mountains, in the hills, bunkers... Uh, just dispersed out amongst the farmlands. He wanted to disperse German industry. So that way the Americans and British couldn't just bomb the factories so easily. Right? Because like, if the, all the factories are in different cities, you can send a force of 500 bombers and just split them up once you get over to the city and bomb all the factories in the city in one mission. Right? So if you disperse it, you're going to have to launch multiple different missions. If you're in a bunker, you might not even be able to damage the factory. Right? But by doing that, it means that you're losing a month, two, three, four, five months of production uh, when you're re relocating all your supplies. So the that was the gist of the U.S. bombing in Europe. Now, importantly for the bombing of Japan in the Pacific Theater, the British employed a different tactic in Europe than the Americans did. They did not use, for the most part, pinpoint bombing. They used a strategy called area bombing, which is a lot easier to do, and uh, in a, to a certain extent more effective, though it really depends. The area bombing doctrine is you take a city with factories in it, and instead of aiming for individual factories, you just level the city. Now the British argued for this as in a kind of tit-for-tat way, where the Germans had bombed them in 1940, they had bombed London and the Blitz, leveled parts of the city. They wanted to do the same to Germany, just as payback, right? You know, it's Hitler. Who, who cares about the Nazis dying? They're Nazis, right? You know, we'll just kill the Nazis. It's fine. The, and they also just... They also used some more material uh, justifications for it, too. As in, you know, well, if you bomb somebody's house... And they can't live there anymore. And if they're a factory worker and they can't live in their house, they're going to have to move somewhere else. Which means they're not going to be able to work at the factory anymore. Which means even if we didn't hit the factory, we still disabled it because workers won't be able to go there anymore to work. So the factory still will not be working. And most of the other arguments fell along those lines. Uh, I'm not going to talk about the morality of it. I'll give you a justification for why people did it. But... I'm not going to go into all sorts of philosophy because I am not a philosopher. That, that is not my area of expertise. Anyway, so that's what the British have been doing. And the Americans have been doing the other thing, pinpoint bombing. And so now we take this to the Pacific. The Americans were the only ones with the capability of bombing Japan. And that is because we had the B-29. Unlike in Europe, we had to have a very long-range bomber. The distance from London to Berlin is 500 miles, 600 miles, maybe th I, at most 1,000 miles. I, I, I doubt it's that much. I need to look it up. But that being said, you don't need a very long-range bomber to like bomb anywhere in Europe, right? Because it it, it's not that far away. If you have the, B the, the B-17 had a... Had a combat range of, I think, 1,500 to, like, yeah, I think about 1,500 miles, where it could go out to 1,500 miles, bomb a target, and come back. I think. Uh, I could be very wrong, but maybe more like a 1,000 anyway. Still, it's pretty long. Plenty of, m plenty of range to bomb most targets that you need in Europe. In the Pacific, our only base that we were, quote-unquote, in range of Japan with was in the Marianas. 
And if you measure out the distance from the Marianas to Tokyo, it's about 1,500 miles, which is way outside that range, that radius of effective bombing range from with the B-17, right? So we had developed a bomber in anticipation of this for since about 1940, and uh, it's called the B-29. You may have heard of it. You, you may have seen it. In fact, I know you have because you're looking at the picture right now. Uh, the B-29 was the largest and most advanced bomber, if not warplane, ever invented up to this point. Now, I know you might be thinking, well, what about the German, you know, jets, right? Right. Like, I know jet engines are pretty cool, but other than the jet engines, they're not really that exceptional. They, they just go faster. Right, the, the guns are the same, the the whole kind of aerodynamic thing is the same, right? Like, theoretically, you could have just put a propeller on that thing and it would just work the same as any other, right? But the B-29 was really advanced. So, I'll talk about, so the engine, the Wright R-3350, even though it was notorious for me uh, mechanical malfunction, it was the most powerful prop engine ever devised up to that point, and there were four of them on the B-29. Four of them. Uh, the, the Boeing company, who was responsible for making the B-29, had developed a new type of wing that maximized aerodynamic lift. So it could carry... It could not only carry the weight of the engines and of the rest of the plane, but it could carry 20,000 pounds of bombs, which was, I think, about triple the bomb load of the B-17. So, that's a lot of bombs. 20,000 pounds of bombs, like, if you're, I, I, well, that's, that's, that's 10 tons of bombs, if you want to put it that, like, I don't know what that is roughly in metric, I think it's a little bit, I think it's a little bit less, like 9 metric tons, but anyway, it's a very large payload. It, it's, you could carry, like, two or three regular cars in the thing, um, and at a range of like, over 1,500, like, 2,000 miles combat range, right? Uh, so, uh, what else? The guns. Yes, the guns. So, the guns were still the same Browning 50 cals that were on every other American plane of the period, because those can, those things can tear up airplanes like no other. But the... I, the thing with the B-29 as opposed to other American bombers and German bombers and British bombers was that these gun turrets were not controlled by a person sitting in them, right? You can see that in the picture. They don't have any windows. How are you going to control them? They are remotely operated gun turrets. You can see up uh, right next to the gun turrets on the top, uh, these, these uh, plastic blisters, as they call them. Uh, that is where the gunners stand and look out and they control them with like a remote control and they and they have a aiming sight and there's targeting computers so what they so all they have to do is point the aim, the sight of the um of their little remote control in their blister toward an enemy airplane and the aiming computer will automatically calculate lead and elevation for you so that you don't even have to worry about that so forget all of your all of your gunnery training at the you know training schools in the United States. Th this is basically just a point and shoot, like some kind of Call of Duty video game thing. Uh, the 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 cockpit was really interesting. The not many planes before it had the uh, just kind of flush cockpit where there's not really a kind of elevated area for the pilots to sit. It just kind of you take the front of the plane and put a whole bunch of windows there. It's actually the inspiration for the Millennium Falcon is that cockpit design with all the windows up front. And the Bombardier sits at the front, gets the best view in the house, a full 360 degree view of the world around him in the front of the plane. So, you know, the, the Bombardier has great vision over the site. Uh, the, the Norton bomb site that they were using was the same one that they were using back in Europe, and it was really good at accuracy at accurately finding the target, you still had to put in your manual, kind of like, you had to get information from the pilot, you know, what altitude you were at, 
that kind of thing, what's, what your speed was. You still had to plug in those numbers manually, but once you did, it was able to figure out exactly what you needed to do in order to drop those bombs directly on the target. Uh, on top of the Norden bomb site, there was a radar bomb site that you can see it kind of under engine number three. Uh, it's a little gray blister on the bottom of the plane, and it was a very rudimentary radar site, but it did theoretically allow for you to bomb a target without even being able to see it. But in reality, they often malfunctioned, and even when they were working, it was not a very good tool to use. It was very early on in that kind of research. But all that being said, all those things put together makes for one of the most advanced airplanes of the time. And so it's capable of flying farther, faster, more fuel efficiently, with more bombs, and with better guns and targeting than any other bomber on Earth. In fact, I've heard stories from reading books that it was able to fly faster than many of the Japanese fighters that were trying to chase it. It was just able to outrun fighter planes that were significantly tinier and had, you know, bigger engine to, you know, had a higher uh, horsepower to weight ratio, right? It was still able to outrun these guys. It, it's astonishing what it could do. Now, all that, with all that having been established, let's get to the whole use of the B-29 in the Pacific. So... The 20th Air Force was the unit established to run B-29s, and it was split up into two bomber commands, one to be run from the captured Marianas, and another to be run from China, Nationalist China, that was our ally. The 21st Bomber Command was in the Marianas, and the 20th, and the 20th Bomber Command in China. 21 Bomber Command was run, originally, by a gentleman named Haywood Possum Hansel. He was one of the guys who actually authored AWPD-1, and he was a very experienced guy in the Air Force, or Army Air Forces. The, it, it's really hard to distinguish the difference between the two, other than kind of like logistics-wise. Um, Hansel, being a veteran of Europe, he had flown with the 8th Air Force in combat missions over Germany. He pursued the same strategy that they had used there, daylight precision bombing. And it was not going that well. Uh, but I'll come back to that in just a little bit, because I want to talk about 20th Bomber Command, 21, or 20 Bomber Command, headed by a fellow named Curtis LeMay, who I was talking about earlier. He was the navigator on that B-17 mission to kill the battleship with dummy bombs, so it didn't actually kill the battleship, but it did technically, right, uh, per the game. Anyway, so he was also a veteran of Europe. He was a very respected commander. People didn't like him, but they respected him. He flew, or tried to flew, or tried to fly on every combat mission in the lead plane. And oftentimes as the pilot of the plane itself. Um, in Europe, he was famous for you know, being the first one in, last one out. And this philosophy he took with him to Asia. His B-29 campaign, though, was also not very successful initially because of one of the war's most difficult logistics problems. He also did the daylight strate uh, precision bombing thing, but this was just kind of icing on the cake to his problems uh, compared to the log logistics of flying in supplies because the Japanese had taken over the Burma road and so you couldn't just send trucks into the Chinese air bases to refuel the planes you had to f haul all of your fuel bombs food other things over the Himalayas into China to in order to run a bomb mission so in order for each B-29 to be able to fly on a mission to Japan and these B-29s based in China could only hit the southernmost island of Japan, uh, Kyushu. The, in order to do that, each B-29 would have to fly, I think, about three flights to, get, to haul enough fuel and bombs over 
for it to be able to fly the mission to Japan and then get back. Because it, it's just crazy. Like, they, they would fly to India, pick up fuel, fly back, do the same thing three times, and then fly to China. It's absolutely nuts how they had to do it. And the combat mi- or and the missions over the Himalayas, as they called it, the hump, were so dangerous because of all the air currents around the la- around the mountains. And there was a serious danger because the Himalayas are such tall mountains. There's a serious danger of you actually not being high enough and just crashing into a mountain. If you're in a cloud bank and you don't know, you just crash into a mountain. That's the end of you, right? They would actually label those as combat missions. So in order for you to fly your 35 missions, you could actually count those missions over the Himalayas as part of your combat tour because they were so dangerous. Anyway, that really was not helpful to the whole operations thing with LeMay. And so he did not get much done. But as we return to 21 Bomber Command in the Marianas, Hansel did not have this kind of excuse. Because he was flying in Marianas with tropical weather. So, like, it rains every once in a while there. But when it does, you know, you just keep your planes on the ground. That's fine. The Navy is responsible for bringing the supplies in by boat. You know, they've got docks on the islands. So the logistics problem is not that bad. The the problems were mainly... The, the problems were twofold. Uh, the planes, it was hard to keep them in, in the air for an extended period of time because of all the me- mechanical difficulties that comes with a really advanced airplane that was rushed into production. And then, second, was the weather. The Japanese anti-aircraft guns were pathetic. And the fighter interceptors were not great, to put it lightly. The main problem that the B-29s faced in their strategic bombing campaign of Japan early on was the weather. Now, these B-29s were flying at higher altitudes than just about any other plane ever before. I think, actually, the highest. And, uh, I think it was about 30, 35,000 feet, which is higher than most commercial jets go these days. If you're on a, if you're on a domestic flight in the U.S., you're not gonna reach that, you're not gonna reach that height. If you're on a flight to Europe, Maybe from the U.S. to Europe, or from Europe to the U.S. They're flying extremely high. Nobody had ever done this before, so this is uncharted territory. They're flying over Japan and dropping their bombs at 35,000 feet on particular factories. Now, between the bomber and the ground is 35,000 feet of air and clouds. 35,000 feet of air and clouds is a lot of room for wind, rain, and other unforeseen factors, I don't know, a bird running into it, anything, uh, is a lot of room for anything to happen to the bomb on, the w- on its way to the target. Bombs would just get blown around in the breeze way off target. M- misses on the factories were often measured in miles rather than in feet or yards. Miles from the factory, which means... You know, you haven't even scratched the factory if, if your bomb lands even half a mile away. So, really not good. This is also compounded by the high, very high speed winds at those altitudes. They did not know this at the time, but this th- phenomena, the very high speed winds, is known as the jet stream. They did not know about this. The planes are getting blown around like a kite in a breeze. These massive planes are just getting smacked around, played with like children's toys by hundreds of miles and hours of winds, right? So on top of trying to, you know, on top of the bomb just having to fall to the target, right, and not get blown around there, the plane itself is getting knocked about by the wind. So it makes for really bad accuracy. Now... Hansel tried working on this, changing altitudes, uh, changing up formations, but none of it was really working, and it only started to work in a very small way on his last mission. I believe it was January 17th, 1945. This late into the war, the, the, like it's still undecided, January 17th, 1945, a mission to the steelworks near Tokyo absolutely clobbered the place. But, Hap Arnold and back in Washington 
had not had a single good result from them that was worth justifying their existence and had already made the decision to replace Hansel with LeMay. Because the idea was that 20th Bomber Command in China was only a temporary thing. They were, it was supposed to move to the Marianas once all of the bases were ready. Because if I am correct, there's one, two, three, four, five, six bases in the Marianas. And only about two or three of them were ready when Hansel started there. So that was just enough for Hansel's guys. So the 20th was moved to China while those extra three bases were being built. Then it was to be moved to the Marianas when those bases were built. Those bases weren't yet completed when LeMay was moved there. But that was the, you know, let's not piss off Hansel excuse for moving LeMay into command. But the real reason was that Hansel was not delivering the results, and he knew it. Hansel admitted that later on. Uh, and so LeMay came in, and I want to say he immediately changed operations and made, you know, turned the whole thing around. No, he didn't. He took over on the 19th of January, and for about a month, just do, did the same thing that Hansel did. He would fly a mission. Not, he himself was not allowed to fly at this point uh, because he knew about the atomic bomb. So he wasn't allowed to be flying on missions so that they wouldn't get captured. But he would order a mission to be flown, try something new, say a difference in altitude or tactics or bomb load. One of the three was usually how it would work. Then the planes would go, do the mission, fly back. He would get the report from the commander who went with the guys on the mission and it would be a dismal failure. That's how it went for about a month. Hap Arnold is starting to really get red in the face. He's already had four stress-related heart stress-related heart attacks by this point in the war, or I think three. Maybe he gets his fourth in 1945. I think. So Arnold really needs something to change it fast uh, for both his personal health and for the health of the up-and-coming Air Force. Right, the the B-29 project costs three billion dollars. To put that in perspective, the Manhattan Project, which developed the atomic bomb, cost only $2 billion. So, there was really a big burden on Arnold and LeMay's shoulder to make this thing work. And so far, it was really not working that well. So, LeMay decides to change something just change the whole game plan. He decides that they're going to fly low at night with no guns or gunners loaded with napalm. That is a complete change in tactics, right? Because, like, you're flying in low. You were flying in high. You're flying with no guns or gunners. The whole idea of the B-29 having the remote-controlled gunners and guns, like, what's that for now? It, at night, like, you can't even see the dang, the darn target, like, it, it's, pitch, it's pitch dark. You're not going to be able to see a thing. And then, and then, it's just like, with napalm? What are you trying to do here, bud? Like, we're trying to destroy factories. We... The factories are metal, man. You're trying to blow up materials like tanks, planes. Why are you trying to burn the factory with napalm? This is jellied gasoline. This is meant for burning down wooden structures. Well, it turns out that that might have just been what LeMay's mind had gone to. Japanese cities, at this time, were made mostly of wood and paper. The Japanese architecture... If you look at traditional Japanese buildings, the ones that are left... Uh, particularly in Kyoto, and some of the temples in Tokyo and the Imperial Palace are still preserved. Uh, they are made of wooden frames with paper and wood walls. So if you're taking jellied gasoline that's on fire and applying it to those buildings... There's nothing that is going to stop that fire from demolishing the building. 
So you can see where this is going. LeMay is switching the U.S. doctrine from precision bombing to area bombing. This is a complete change in tactics. The U.S. up until this point had taken the moral high ground, saying, we're only destroying factories. Those British, those British people are are monsters. They're bombing entire German cities and leveling to the ground. Just look at Dresden. Look at Hamburg. Look at what they have done. Right? Like, and now all of a sudden, where are we now? The, we're, we're the ones who are preparing to bomb an entire city to the ground. So, now, the justification for this is that the Japanese war economy was highly dispersed. Not in the same way that the German one was, where it was deliberate, but the Japanese war economy was dispersed just by the, just how the Japanese economy at that point worked. There were not many factories. Not many factories. And the ones that were there were mostly assembly plants taking sub-assemblies made elsewhere and putting them into completed parts, or completed units, right? Aircraft, tanks, not many tanks, but aircraft, guns, etc. Where were those component parts coming from? They were coming from small workshops, most of them in people's basements. Which means that in order to stop the factories from getting their supplies, you can't just bomb the factory, you have to bomb people's houses, because that's where the, that's where the stuff that the factory is making comes from. Which means that you're going to have to bomb people's houses. That it, it, Unlike in Germany, where you're just bombing the houses with the justification of, well, if we kill the worker or make him homeless, he won't be able to work. You're not trying to kill the worker, you're just trying to kill the stuff he's working on. And it happens to be in his house. So it's a really ugly situation, that. And uh, LeMay makes the hard decision that we're going to have to cut the Japanese economy at the source, right? We're going to have to stop their production before it even begins. And so, early in March, the whole month of February, he had, he had been experimenting, his crews start training on these low-altitude night missions, and they start getting a sense of how it's going to work. And a nit, like, the, the crews are flabbergasted when they're told on the night of August 9th or uh, but the day of August 9th, 1945 that they're going to go in low at night with no guns and gunners with firebombs they're, they're stunned but also at the same time they haven't really hit a target in nine months of having been there and they really want to prove themselves worthy of the title of the 20th Air Force flying the most advanced aircraft in the world. So, they're fairly receptive to the idea, but skeptical. So, what LeMay had been waiting for, the reason why August 9th was picked, was he wanted a dry, windy night. That way, when you start a fire, it's dry, so it's easier to start a fire, and it's windy, so that the fire spreads. And... That night happened to be a dry and windy night. And the uh, code name for the place that they were, the target that they were bombing, was Meeting House. Now, you may be familiar with it as Edo. Probably not. That's the old name for the city. The city is now called Tokyo. It was then, it is now, but it was called Edo before. Tokyo is. It is the capital of Japan. It is the one of the largest urban areas on Earth. And it had not been touched at all, except for a number of bombs falling haphazardly in the hills, maybe on a factory, you know, since 1942, right? Like... Hansel's guys had really not affected the whole operation of the city. Not not that much. You, you know, maybe if... The, the, the one factory, the steel plant, that they had clobbered on January 17th, that, that's, that's about the only significant thing that they had done to Tokyo. 
So the Emperor is just sitting pretty, you know, watching or hearing that his empire is dying, but not really seeing any evidence of it, except for the occasional B-29 flight. So, the May really wants to prove, you know, to to the, not only the Air Force, to the American people, but also to the Japanese, that they are vulnerable, that they can be hit, and that their Air Force cannot do anything about it. So, the night of March 9th comes, about 320 B-29s rev up their engines, and if you have ever, I've had the privilege to hear a B-29 rev up its engines and take off, take my word for it, it is loud. 320 of them rev up their engines and take off on the night of March 9th, headed for Meeting House, Tokyo, with their bombs, some of them with guns and gunners, against orders, most without they all take off individually. They don't fly in formation and navigate themselves to the target. They're split up into about four groups, five groups. The first group is to bomb the very center urban area of Tokyo and bomb it in a such a way that kind of a X appears in the flames. Kind of an X marks the spot. And each of the four groups behind it had been assigned a particular corner of that X to bomb. Now, the reason that they did this was so that everybody would be bombing in the same kind of narrow area. That way you can maximize the fire, right? So that everything in that area catches on fire, makes this huge blaze that spreads to the rest of the city. The first wave comes in, drops their bombs. Second wave comes in, drops their bombs, third wave, fourth wave, fifth wave. They're flying back. While this is happening, on the ground, uh, the first pathfinders, the B-29s that drop the X marks the spot, you know, the, the fire starts in certain pockets. The next wave comes in, and between about midnight and 3 a.m., the following waves come in, after about 30 minutes from the first bombs dropped, the flames are already out of control. Uh, entire neighborhoods of the city were burnt to the ground. The, the wind carried the fire over many parts of the city. People f fled their homes, fled for their lives. They had never experienced anything like this before in their, in their entire lives. And it, it's unimaginable exactly how it must have felt I I've never met anyone who was there but like imagine yourself in a city on fire an entire city on fire the temperatures rose to 1800 degrees Fahrenheit which is enough but well, it's plenty to boil water you're already dead if you're feeling the 1800 degrees Fahrenheit because all of the fluids inside your body would have burned off. Essentially, you you may have very well just evaporated. Just like turned into, like combusted and then turned into water. Like water vapor. People would jump into rivers hoping to find shelter from the flames just to be found that they're boiled alive inside the river because the river water is boiling. The very asphalt on the streets, which is a mix of, you know, concrete and rubber, is boiling. Boiling. The temperatures are extremely hot. Uh, it's unimaginably hot. The 16.5 square miles of the city was burned that night. And to give you a sense of the sheer scale of that... Tokyo at that point only covered about 25 square miles of land. 16 and a half of those is reduced to ash. Over 100,000 people were killed that night. The estimates range from the low end, 100,000. That's the official number that the Japanese gave based on census information. It's likely much higher. I'd put the highest number at around 250,000, though I'd estimate it's more in the range of a bit less than 200,000. Between 150 and 200,000 is my guess. 
many, about a million people were made homeless, and hundreds of thousands of others wounded. What we did to Tokyo was awful. It is. Like, it's awful to imagine what happened. But, when you put it in perspective of what could have happened, and why we had to do it, it it just... It's one of the unfortunate realities of war, that you have to do things like this on occasion. LeMay ordered, over the next week, ten days, I think, this to happen every day to another ten cities. And he did this and leveled about another 25 square miles of other Japanese cities. If you're, you're thinking Osaka, Kobe, cities like that on the main island of Honshu. Uh, and he did this until he ran out of firebombs. He, he ran out of napalm in a week. All the napalm stored up in the Marianas Islands, gone. Just dropped on Japanese cities. So if you're looking at the total numbers here, we're, about a th we're at about 35 square miles of Japanese cities destroyed. Level to, level to the ground. Right, um... Then the Navy starts frantically shipping LeMay more napalm because they didn't believe him when he said he could drop all that napalm in a week. So they start frantically sending him more napalm. But he's only able to start resuming missions in earnest with the napalm in, in June. June, July, August. Another 45 square miles of Japanese cities obliterated. Same way. Until in mid-August, or no, early August, August 6, 1945, a new weapon is deployed to the Marianas. No one's allowed to see it, except for a few very privileged people who are working in it, who are working on it in an air-conditioned building. Now, in the Marianas, these barracks that the B-29 pilots and crews lived in were not air-conditioned. This building was air-conditioned, and nobody lived there. Why? Because it was the home, temporary home, of... The world's, soon to be the world's first m atomic bomb used in military action. Little boy, as they called it. August 6, 1945 rolls around. Four B-29s take off. Or, no, three. Uh, one of them is named the Great Artiste. Another doesn't have a name yet, but will be called Necessary Evil later on. And the third is called... Enola Gay. Now, this bomber is the most famous one. Because it's the one that's carrying the bomb. These are modified B-29s, which only have one bomb bay instead of two. Or, like, I don't know why that there was two bomb bays. I, I'm not an expert on the engineering of the whole thing. I know some of the facts about it that are cool, but I can't tell you why. It only had one bomb bay, because it was specially designed to carry these nuclear bombs. And early in the morning at about 8 o'clock, Japanese time I think, at about 8 o'clock, three of these three bombers show up over Hiroshima. And the Japanese people, because they're used to seeing these hundreds of B-29s fly over their cities, you know, they, they make nothing of it, the alarms don't go off. Uh, they see a couple parachutes dropping from the sky, and they cheer because they think that their anti-aircraft fire has shot down one of the B-29s. Turns out that these are actually instruments that are supposed to measure the magnitude of the blast that are being dropped by parachute to get readings from the great artiste and soon-to-be necessary evil. Paul Tibbetts, the commander of the 509th Composite Group responsible for dropping these bombs, flies, B flies his B-29 right over the city, hands over control to his bombardier, who plants the bomb site reticle on a T-shaped bridge in the center of the city. They drop the bomb and immediately make a sharp left banking turn to get as far away from the bomb, from the epicenter of the explosion, as is humanly possible. As they're flying away, it takes about a minute and a half for the bomb to fall from 30,000 feet, 35,000 feet, down to 1,850 feet, the optimal air blast detonation point for the bomb to make the most damage. It explodes, there's a bright white flash, and then 
a fireball consumes about half of downtown Hiroshima. 80,000 people die. Three days later, another bomber, this time named Boxcar, spelt like the uh, German or Austrian composer Johann Sebastian Bach, not the, not like a uh, B-O-X box. Boxcar uh, drops a bomb named after Winston Churchill, Fat Man, on the Japanese city of Nagasaki. I cannot substantiate this report, but I've heard from one of my friends who has heard from something, someone else that it may or may not have detonated directly over the site of a Catholic church, though I cannot confirm that. Uh, it explodes, vaporizes about 40,000 people because it wasn't dropped on target because of cloud cover. So it wasn't hitting right at the center of that city. 80,000 plus 40,000 is about 120,000. The Tokyo firebombing mission using a conventional weapon, or, well, not just a conventional weapon, many thousands of conventional weapons, killed 30, 50,000, maybe as much as 70,000 more people than that, if you want to go to the high end. So, why, why did we do all this? I, again, the, the, the material doctrine reasons, right, Japanese war economy, Japanese need to surrender. The invasion of Japan. I'll do an episode on that. The the Operation Downfall, the invasion of Japan, was scheduled for about three months from August. And it, just to give you a sense, I'll, I'll say one one fact about it, and I'll leave it. I'll leave the rest for that episode. The plan was for troops to land in Japan using tactical nuclear support. I won't say any more. It was going to be awful. We needed to end the war, and soon. Otherwise, millions of people were going to die. So not only did the B-29 campaign end the war in a timely manner, it also, dis it, well, it crippled the Japanese war industry, which is a result of ending the war, right? It saved lives by preventing the invasion of Japan, and I, it, it allowed for the... It allowed for the Air Force to become its own thing, I'd say. I'd say that. It was probably gonna... Uh, it was probably... The the Air Force was destined to become its own branch, but the B-29 campaign over Japan proved to the world that unlike in Germany, where the Allies had actually managed to invade Germany and take it all over, Japan had been defeated by nothing else but air power. Not a single American, Russian, British, Commonwealth soldier had stepped foot in Japan before they surrendered. Except for those who were parachuted out of B-29s who had, you know, that were uh, captured, right? But, uh, the, Japan had been defeated solely by air power. And that's, that's the big lesson taken from the strategic bombing of Japan. Uh, I don't really have much more to say on that. If you have any questions about specifics, I'd be more than happy to answer them in the comments. Just, 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 uh, leave a comment and I'll try and answer it as best as I can. I wrote a 10-page research paper on it, so I might be able to just quote that instead of actually coming up with my own answer. <laughs> but I've got plenty of books, recommendations on it. I've got about seven of them. Um... And maybe this th this is definitely a topic I'll revisit in the future, because uh, I can't do it justice now. But I'm already going way past the time I was supposed to spend talking about this. It's been about it, I think it's been over an hour now. <laughs> uh, when I was supposed to talk for only about thirty minutes. So, anyways, I hope you guys enjoyed listening to this. I'm gonna try and figure out a way to not just upload this to YouTube, but also to Spotify or some other podcast service instead of just like a video service anyway i hope you guys enjoyed if you did be sure to leave a like subscribe if you want to see more like this and i hope to see you in the next video sorry for not uploading in over a year i just uh i i have no excuse i i 
I can't even say I got busy. There was plenty of time for me to do one of these. I, I just completely neglected this. So I hope that you enjoyed this hour-long special episode. Um, and have a great rest of your day. So, see you guys later. Have fun. And uh, take a read on this stuff, th this subject. Like, I, I don't even care. It could be a Wikipedia page. It is good stuff. Curtis LeMay is a very interesting character that you. I think that all Americans should learn a lot more about than they do that already know. So anyways, see you guys later. And, uh, well, as of right now, it's 10.54 p.m. So good night.